XDL is very, very pleased to bring you Cecilia Loving. We spoke to her recently, and there were so many things that we wanted to chat about that uh, we didn't have the time to speak about. So we're going to try to remedy that now. And uh, we're going to talk about some of the books that you've written. But uh, my first question to you is, uh, what made you decide to become an author in the first place? Now, I know as a lawyer and as a litigator, you're called upon to write, but that's not necessarily creative. As a matter of fact, creative writing is probably frowned upon in the law. But what you've done is creative and spiritual. So what? how is it that you uh, came to start writing that way? Well, uh, I have always been a poet since I was a teenager. One of my older brothers was uh, a poet. And so that's always been a part of my life. And I had what you would call probably a near-death experience, something that I rarely share with people. But when I was about 17, I was on my proverbial deathbed. I was in the hospital. The doctors didn't know what was wrong with me. They had surgeries, etc. And I had a lot of old saints, salt, salt of the earth saints in the south and throughout the country praying for me. And at some point I pulled through. And I remember very clearly the morning that I pulled through. I sat up in, in my hospital bed. The sun was beaming down. And the Holy Spirit said, you will live to write. And so that's a very clear calling, but it's not one that I paid heed to, interestingly enough, until after I had practiced law for a long time. After I had written a lot of briefs and a lot of motions and had been under the tutelage of a lot of very senior lawyers who were excellent writers. And all of a sudden, the bell and the whistle went off and I realized, you know what, you haven't lived up, you haven't done one of the things that you know that you were called to do. And so I uh, began to write a book called Prayers for Those Standing on the Edge of Greatness. And when I first wrote the book, I actually didn't have a title to it. And I was sitting in my office one day and uh, one of my fellow students in seminary. I was practicing law full-time and going to New York Theological Seminary at the same time and one of my classmates who was a pastor came to my office for me to help her with something. She was working on a project for uh, spirituality and women and before she left my office she looked at me and she said you are just standing on the edge of greatness and I thought aha that's the title for my book because this is a book that helps people in whatever their pursuit are, but it gives them some basic spiritual principles about how to move from where they are until the next phase of their life. And so I call it Prayers for Those Standing on the Edge of Greatness. It's not um, a book of, that are, that's just comprised of prayers, but it's comprised of spiritual tools and, and faith and, and vision and, and using the power of your words and, and practicing love in a way that moves you from where you are until the next point of you, in your life. Well, I would compare your writings uh, to an extent uh, to authors like Florence Scoville Shin and Catherine Ponder, Neville, and James Allen. Okay? Well, thank you. And, uh, but there's a difference. I, I guess, first of all, I want to ask you, uh, obviously you're familiar with these people and you've read you know, some, of, some of their works, right? Uh, were you at all influenced by uh, any of those writers? I, I was influenced by all of them, just in terms of my study of metaphysics, but I think that one of the most influential writers on me is someone who doesn't write in the same genre. She doesn't write metaphysical books in a traditional sense, but that's Toni Morrison. And Toni Morrison says something very profound that informs my writing. She said, write the book that you would want to read. And when I wrote God is a Brown Girl too, that's exactly what I did. This is a book about the first time that God speaks to black women as themselves. God speaks to women of color as themselves. And so if you really think about it, if the kingdom of God is within us, then why isn't the kingdom of God talking like us? I think a lot of times we get lost in believing that God is some old white man in the sky, and on we don't point, admit to that. On that point, I want to interrupt you. 
Uh, there's an author, uh, he's actually a clinical psychologist by the name of uh, Dr. Naim Akbar. And he wrote a book called Chains and Images of Psychological Slavery. And the thesis of this book is, uh, he basically puts it in the form of a question. What is the psychological impact on black people worshiping a God figure that's portrayed as white? And what is the psychological impact on white people worshiping a God figure that's portrayed as white? Mm -hmm. So throughout my studies, I took that and I thought about, well, what's the impact on women worshiping a God figure that's portrayed as a male? And what is the impact on male men worshiping a God figure that's portrayed as a male? And so uh, when I started reading uh, the book, one of your books that I'm like uh, one third of the way through, which I'm loving right now, God is a Lawyer too. Mm. I saw that you kind of touched on that and uh, it seems to me that you're challenging notions of uh, trying to uh, portray, you know, the creator as one particular entity or one particular, uh, you know, with a racial component or a gender component. And in fact, uh, it almost sounded like, uh, to an extent, nature and Shoshu Buddhism, to the extent that you were talking about uh, spirit as law. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so I kind of, uh, you know, wanted to talk about that and. Uh, you know, have you explained to us a little more about God as a Brown Girl, too, before we get into the book that I'm reading right now? Okay, well, as, as Paul said, we live and we move and we have our being in God. So there is no separation from who we are and who God is. But a lot of times we lose perspective of that. We would love to give someone else the responsibility for our lives. And one of the things I was reaching for God is a brown girl too, because one of the poems in here, in the beginning of one of the chapters that informs the book for me, is one of the seeds that crystallize the book for me, is one that says, who will find, and this is just a part of the, the poem, who will find the courage to lift their legacy out of the realm of the forgotten and speak the truth once again? Not that we are looking for God, but oh, that we have found her. And, and so it's very important to me for us not to continue to give our power to anything, anyone, any source, it outside of ourselves, but to realize that we are absolute good and that the power is within us. And most importantly, if everyone cannot realize that from the perspective of knowing that the most marginalized, the most denigrated person in society who tends to be the brown girl is also God then I don't think they can really fully recognize God as themselves and God as so all-pervasive and omnipotent and omnipresent and omniscient that it is in each and every one of us. And so I'm so glad that you brought up that, that particular book about us worshiping someone that we could never be, someone who would not have our best interest. And I think it works uh, both ways because the uh, person who sees God portrayed uh, in their own image is more likely to denigrate, uh, you know, or not respect at the very least, uh, individuals who pre present themselves with a different image. Yes, I, and that is most certainly the case. And um, apropos to that, one of the things that I like to focus on as a teacher of spiritual principles is really some of the divine laws. And I bring this up in the book, God is a Lawyer. Which too. I am reading right now, and I have to ask you a couple things about it, okay? Uh, I'm about one third of the way through, so don't reveal all of it. Okay, to I me, won't. <laughs> okay? I'm just about at the part where, uh, oh, where, where uh, Najee uh, is exposed to the art collection of Pat Bradford, okay? okay? And so then I had to close the book up when I read it because <laughs> okay. you know him and I've met him. I can't say that, you know, that he's a friend, but I've met him several times, probably through you. 
okay, and uh, he is an important lawyer, uh, you know, in New York City, and he does have a magnificent. What I like about this book, okay, I think that non-lawyers can read it, okay, but lawyers are going to read it and just like it's going, it's going to, they're going to be able to relate in a way that like it's just really going to be like you know astonishing to them. And then I also like the fact that I recognize uh, Brooklyn. I recognize uh, Cobble Hill, and I recognize Borum Hill, and I also recognize Midtown and the big firms, okay? And so uh, the Tabernacle, I, would that be like 1166? Well, I'm not naming any names okay. because this is the, you know, what I love about this book is that it is the first time that I have written a novel. Because I usually read nonfiction and I have been writing nonfiction. I have to write nonfiction every Sunday when I speak. And I really believe as, as an artist, as, as an author, that you don't really control your work. But that spirit breathes it through you. And you just have to be an open and obedient vessel. But see, this is the value of that particular book because you're, you're uh, laying forth very, you know, I mean, you know, well recognized, at least to people who have who understand this, very you know well recognized spiritual principles. But you're revealing it through some characters, uh, the main protagonist, who uh, you know who you kind of like, and then his uh, his uh, enemy who has just uh, kind of like evaporated with a Starbucks at the point where I where I left him. Uh, his girlfriend, who is also a, a lawyer, just to give people a little background, the, 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 there are a couple characters in this book. The main ones are Naji, who's a lawyer, okay, who's very dissatisfied with his law practice, as uh, might be expected because uh, ever since I've been a lawyer, job dissatisfaction has been running rampant in the profession, and it's worse now. It's probably uh, worse now than at any time that uh, I've ever seen it. And so we're following him and his what his aspirations are as a lawyer and the fact that his dream is being stepped on every day that he goes out to make money because he basically is not doing what he is put here to do, but he's doing what's expedient. This is complicated by uh, his relationship with Yashita who uh, is also a lawyer, and uh, I'm waiting to see how they're going to resolve that, okay? Whether they're going to make it, whether they're not going to make it, but in order for them to make it, uh, because I see that he's uh, becoming spiritually open, and so she's going to have to be or else. But don't, don't tell well, me the ending. Well, one thing I do want to say, at one point I want to make about God as a lawyer, too, is that non-lawyers really love this book. And I've had a few people show up at Spirit Move and say, I want to be here, people who are non-lawyers, because I read this book or I knew about this book. And so it touches the lives of anybody who really wants to change the situation they're in. And the interesting thing about it is that there is a whole culture of temp lawyers. Now, in today's age, there are so many lawyers who are warehoused into document reviews who are being paid a, spending a their set entire rate, careers spending doing their document entire production. career, and a lot of them feel very locked in and suffocated and unable to move forward well, in the their lives. Well, the money is good, but guess what? At the end of several years of doing nothing but document production, uh, you are not suited. To, you're actually unemployable, okay, because you don't know motion practice. You don't know how to lay an evidentiary foundation to move a document into evidence. He certainly can't be trusted to try a case. And, I mean, aside from that, I mean, those are very specifics that we know about. But it's like any other situation of, of being locked in, of feeling immobile, of, of, of believing that you can't proceed in your life, you can't move forward. And so what do you do in order to, to, to change things? And so this book gives you various what I call divine laws or spiritual laws to begin to change your life. I believe that spirituality is really based on spiritual principles. If you put these things into practice, they work. One of the first law is the, is the law of believing. 
If you don't believe, you know, the Bible says, ask and you shall receive. Implicit in that is that you have to believe that you will receive. If you don't, then you're not going to really be able to manifest what you have the power to bring into your life. One of the other spiritual laws is the law of loving. You have love is one of the most is the most powerful thing that there is. And so it teaches how do you work with those laws? One of the other laws, the one of the very last laws I can mention that you haven't uh, gotten to yet is the law of doing even greater things. Jesus says, I have walked the water. I have raised the dead. I have made the blind see. I have healed lepers. But these and even greater things shall you do. And we forget that. We want to sit around and think, well, we can't do anything. We can't change anything. But we have the power right within ourselves to do that. To make a difference and that's what this book talks about well and that's what uh, to me is important about Naji because uh, he's by all outside you know uh, measures he's living the dream okay he's practicing law he's making money okay he's wearing designer suits he gets to go to the gym and work out and you know lives with like you know uh, another lawyer so it's like two incomes and doing their thing but he's like uh, nah satisfied. He knows he's not living up to his true potential. And so I can't give away the end of the story. Please don't. But you'll be surprised by what happens. And I'm working on uh, my next book that sort of follows from this whole sequence. It's called God is a Baby Too. I was working on that. And it's also fiction. So that's going to be, I think, even more exciting than God is a Lawyer Too. Well, I can't wait to, uh, read, to read that one. But frankly, uh, I can't wait to finish uh, the, the rest of God as a Lawyer, too, because I am enjoying it. And uh, I think that, you know, people that are in the profession will, I mean, it really is an eye-opener, okay? And, uh, yeah, I can see how people that are not practicing attorneys, they can, they can get it. But uh, when you start talking about, like, uh, people that are, like, you know, clicking all this responsive, non-responsive, I'm, like, I'm totally in it. Okay, thank God I don't have to do that kind of work right now. But. Well, I, I want to put in a plug also, there is a workbook that accompanies God is a Lawyer too, And I was able to do a series of workshops at one of the law firms in the city, Patterson Bell Knapp sponsored uh, a three-part workshop. I'm going to be doing something else at the city bar, but it we actually were able to use a lot of the tools and I gave a lot of the lawyers exercises so that they could continue to use them outside of the workshop. And so this is starting to create some energy in our community to bring about the changes that we need. Well, it's working for me because uh, there is someone who I uh, get the pleasure of working with regularly and uh, I think in order to change that I'm going to start blessing them with love because what you say is when I do that either they're going to change or they're going to go away. Now, I don't care which one happens. <laughs> yes. It's all good. They can change or they can leave. Okay, <laughs> But I'm going to start treating them and so I, that's something I got out of, uh, out of that book uh, yesterday. Well that that's wonderful because that definitely works. So that's a blessing right there. I'm holding you to it. <laughs> yes. Cecilia, thank you so much thank for spending you. time with us. And we look forward to chatting with you again in the very near future. Thanks a lot, Drake.